I grew up in a relatively strict Christian home. So for us as kids, the standard was no bad words. And to give you an idea of what counted as a bad word, um, I'm going to tell you the threshold was pretty low. I remember driving with my parents and there was a country music song on the radio by someone named Mary Chapin Carpenter. And the line in the song and the title of the song was Shut Up and Kiss Me. My sisters and I used to sing that song as and kiss me because shut up didn't meet the threshold of what was a word that we were allowed to say. So given that standard, you can imagine my surprise when I saw a book uh, that my parents had purchased sitting in our house that had a bad word right in the title. I remember being confused at finding Microsoft for Dummies sitting on the table. What in the world could have compelled my dad to purchase a book with a bad word right in the, in the name and then bring it into our home? That question was largely answered uh, for me now as an adult who has a different standard of bad word, but also as someone who is a regular uh, consumer of how-to guides. I look for them for any problem that I'm coming up against, any situation I don't uh, understand. And I can see now that my dad was willing to overlook the title because of the value that was in the content of the book. Maybe you've found yourself wondering about the how-to guide as it relates to this message series. We are going to spend some time this morning on the practices of peacemaking, uh, which are essentially the postures and the practices that the Bible gives us on the how-to guide of peacemaking in our relationships and in the world around us. It's important to know that peacemaking isn't passive, but it is instead the result of active and really engaged practices. I personally have found uh, the first couple of weeks of this series to be really inspiring as we've heard more and more about what peace is and isn't. That it is not only the absence of conflict, but the absence, but instead it is an active presence and a way of being. We heard last week from Tom that some of the standard things that we do as humans in order to pursue peace are not actually the things that bring peace that the means don't justify the end because the means is the end. And I don't know about you, but I've had some moments, some vulnerable moments, as I am being really honest and raw with myself about the state of some of the relationships that I'm in that are not thriving or even some where there's active conflict. And I've found myself wondering how we go about the really challenging but necessary work of peacemaking. There's a passage in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5 where Paul is talking to the church in Corinth and it describes followers of Jesus as the ministers of reconciliation, as people who are doing the ministry of reconciliation. The language used in that passage is that we are to be the ambassadors of Christ, doing the work of reconciling with God and with one another. The passage further gives some insight uh, to the postures that we are to have towards people. And I think it starts there for a really important reason. The postures are the starting point for the how-to. And the practices flow from there. We have to get those postures right first. So first of all, in this passage, it says that because of Christ, we no longer view people from a worldly point of view. We no longer view people through the lens of who they are to me or to you. We no longer view people through the lens of what they can offer or what they have done or how they look or how they contribute or any of those pieces that are so common in the ways that we approach people in our lives. So what do we do instead? Instead, we view people as the very image bearers of Christ as people who were made in the image of Christ and have that value for exactly who they are. Think for a moment on just how different our posture would be towards people if we actually viewed them as representatives of Jesus in the world. I think the other posture uh, that is identified in the 2 Corinthians passage is to, um, is to really take that posture towards people that we don't count people's sins against them. We no longer regard people as an account of their wrongdoings. We don't engage with people based on what we know about the histories of choices or decisions that they've made. We do have something completely different. So what is that thing that we do different? How do we approach people? 
in the way that Jesus uh, represented himself as the very embodiment of love to the world, we also are to embody that love towards one another in a posture of gentleness and patience, particularly in times of conflict. And I will acknowledge that this posture towards people, especially when there's conflict or there's hurt present, can require some really deep and intentional uh, internal work for us. I think it's not the natural way that our humanness tends to show up in relationships, but it is the posture that we should adopt when wading into the practices of peacemaking. So once we have these postures, what are those practices of peacemaking? I've made reference to them a couple of times, but what are they? I think the first is that we go directly to the person that we have conflict with. It says in Matthew 18, verse 15, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. Now, we're not provided with all sorts of the conditions or the caveats on when you go directly to the person. It does not say if you believe that they'll be open to it, uh, or if you feel like it will make a difference, or if you feel brave or courageous enough to do so. And it certainly doesn't say only if you want to. It says go directly to the person. Now, that potentially feels pretty contrary to a lot of our natural inclinations. In a book called Redeeming Conflict, the author's name is Anne Garrido, and she refers to this tendency in us um, as triangulation, the pro- it really referring to the propensity of two people in conflict with one another to go to a third person instead of direct to the one where the sin or the conflict exists. And she suggests that we do this for a couple of reasons. But I think that the one that is probably most common is that we do this process of triangulation to find a sympathetic ear to our narrative. The more times that I can recount my version of what happened, the more set in that narrative I become. And if I have someone who is sympathetic to me, it helps me to feel justified in my role in the conflict. The role that I might have played can actually be sanitized out of my own version. And this really allows me to be more comfortable with myself. Really, at the end of the day, it's a method of conflict avoidance. Now, this author, Anne Greedo, she describes the other reason why we commonly triangulate in conflict, and that is because we want to, or sometimes we feel the need to subvert the structures that are in place that move us towards redeeming conflict. I think this can be true uh, in relationships where there is an authority structure existing. So sometimes in an employee-employer relationship, or maybe a parent and child relationship, or even and certainly within the church. I think the thing for us to keep in mind though is that the process, or sorry, the practice of triangulating in conflict can breed distrust and discontent and even division in a broader community. What happens is that the conflict remains unresolved because we might feel better about it having talked it through enough times and feeling uh, justified in our narrative of what happened, but the conflict itself is not resolved. If anything, we feel less of the need to resolve it properly because some of the fire is gone and therefore it's not resolved and it lingers like a bit of a low grade fever, just waiting for those right circumstances to fire right back up again. That's why, as a community, we want to lean into the Jesus wisdom of going directly to the person. In my role here at Southridge, um, I oversee our homelessness services department. And as part of our annual performance reviews that we do, we have people do a self-assessment on a whole bunch of different factors that really leads to a conversation managers will have with their staff. One of the areas for self-reflection is around whether or not we manage conflict quickly, quietly, and effectively. And I've always really appreciated that, primarily because it provides a framework for ensuring that we don't allow conflict to linger. That's the quickly. We don't wait weeks or months to try to address the conflict. Uh, It gives the framework that we go directly to the person without bringing in a lot of unnecessary people to the conflict. That's the quietly and that we pursue genuine reconciliation to be able to move forward in a resolved way, which is the effectively. This has really helped uh, to provide a framework for how we deal with the inevitable conflict that arises uh, as we are people working and living together. 
Now, we don't do this perfectly, but in all things related to uh, the practices of peacemaking, it's important to know that the attitude and the posture trumps the technique. If we've gone directly to the person, how do we engage next? I think as we work towards peace in our relationships, another practice is the work of engaging in genuine dialogue with a focus on really listening to understand. The real, the desire to understand is the key distinctive between dialogue and debate, whereas debate can most accurately be boiled down to the successful argument of my position or my narrative over my opponent, dialogue is different than that. Dialogue is a cooperative conversation, leaning into relationship and leaning into learning. In our service a couple weeks ago, we engaged in a spiritual practice using what is commonly referred to as the peace prayer uh, from St. Francis of Assisi. And one part of it reads, O Divine Master, grant that I might not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. So what does it take for us to be able to listen for understanding rather than approaching conversations with the goal simply of being right? I will suggest that our posture towards people, viewing and valuing people as image bearers of Christ, establishes that we have something valuable to gain in learning from one another. Oftentimes in conflict, we can get caught up in the practices of listening for the purpose of defending our position, picking up on the main point that's being said, but then spending the rest of the other person's time talking uh, in our heads, beginning to craft the argument that we will use in response, rather than seeking to enter into the fullness of what's being said. I think we often listen for what is wrong, illogical, or sometimes inconsistent because that gives us content for the debate. The alternative to this kind of listening is to engage in empathetic listening, listening to grasp the meaning of what is uh, of what is being said for the other person rather than just the words. Empathetic listening involves uh, listening further for the meaning, asking questions like, what does this mean for the story, the larger story that this person is living or telling themselves? What does this mean for this person's value? Uh, what emotion is behind uh, whatever this person is saying? Again, empathetic listening at its very core, it requires us to hold a posture of genuine care for the other person, that we ascribe value and worth to their voice and experience. And I really do believe that this kind of, that the kind of conversations that we have would look really different if we engaged in empathetic listening. Lastly, the practices of peacemaking as it relates to our relationships with people requires us to acknowledge our sins and the hurt that we've caused to people. Forgiving others, forgiving one another uh, when we've been hurt and when appropriate, working towards reconciliation. James 5 verse 16, uh, James tells us to confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. I think it's important to note here that this direction is not simply that we have a single accountability person in our confession to pursuing healing from God. See, James, throughout the entirety of his letter, appeals to believers around the way that we seek for things to be good with God while resisting the way that we live out our faith as loving to people. And I would suspect that what James means in his letter is drawing us into an understanding that we are made right with God as we and through the process of making things right with one another. I can remember really clearly a particular instance where I had to do this uh, and some of the learnings that have stuck with me to this day. I needed to confess and apologize for something that I had done that had unintentionally caused a lot of hurt to a colleague of mine. And the one thing that sticks out so clearly in my recollection of that conversation was actually the discipline that it took for me to not provide a lot of justification for what I had done, which was my natural instinct. See, I wanted to explain why I had done that, feeling as though their appreciation for my reason would help to absolve me of the guilt that I was feeling. But that's not what I needed to do. I actually needed to apologize for the act, not explain or excuse myself for meaning well. The other thing that I remember so clearly about that conversation was the offer of forgiveness. 
See, forgiveness is both something that we can offer to the person apologizing to us and to the person who isn't. It's the means by which we are released from carrying the weight that that, of that hurt moving forward, which sometimes means that the offending person doesn't actually even need to be involved. Referring back to that book, Redeeming Conflict, the author notes that forgiving someone can sometimes feel like we need to minimize the hurt or the pain that we're feeling. And I know for some that the very suggestion of forgiveness feels like it invalidates the injustice that was done uh, to them. But really, what forgiveness does is it transfers the weight and the heaviness uh, that we feel about that injustice from us to God. It frees us from carrying it and allowing the hurt of that situation to drive our thoughts and our actions. In Ephesians uh, 4, verse 31 and 32, it says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, just as in Christ, God forgave you. See, we forgive because we have been forgiven. It is the expectation of us as receivers of that gift from God. But forgiveness and moving on are not the same. Lastly, the work towards reconciliation, which is the work of restoring a relationship or the work of making that relationship right again. There's not a guarantee of reconciliation in human relationships coming out of conflict. But I do really believe that there is beautiful potential there. Archbishop Desmond Tutu, uh, who was the leader of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, describes reconciliation as the renewal of relationship, not returning to what once was. He says, we do not make a carbon copy of the relationship that we had before the hurt or the insult. Renewing a relationship is a creative act. We create a new relationship out of suffering one that is often stronger for what we have experienced together. I remember years ago when my husband and I got married, uh, we had marriage mentors who journeyed with us in the preparation towards our our wedding and our marriage. And over dinner one night, uh, they made reference to the depth of love that grows through conflict. I remember very clearly, he said, you think you love one another now, but just wait until you've been through the experience of breaking their heart and reconciling after. Now, that's, I think that's something that someone just months from their wedding might not totally understand. And I know that he was not telling us to look forward to the hurt that we would cause or to the hard conversations coming out of acknowledging and coming to terms with that hurt or anything like that. I now understand that he, speaking from 40 plus years of marriage, was referring to the new depths of love that can come from a reconciled and renewed relationship. By way of time out, um, I would like to add that there are some situations that absolutely should not be reconciled. So if you're listening to this right now and you are in a situation where you are unsafe, if you're in a relationship where you're being hurt, please do not hear this as an encouragement to continue to stick it out. There are situations with abuse involved that you might need to completely remove yourself from. So maybe at this point, you're thinking about a situation that you're in where there is a need for reconciliation, or maybe you feel as though you are into that situation and you've done these steps. You've gone directly to the person, you've listened for understanding and genuine dialogue, you've attempted to do the work of reconciliation, and things still are not moving forward. I think it's easy in those times to feel like the next step is to put our hands up and to say, you know, I've tried, it's not meant to be, it's not working. And sometimes just uh, in those circumstances, we feel like we need to walk away. But I would suggest that in those times, we have to lean into the truth of Romans 12, 18. Romans 12, 18 says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. See, at the end of the day, it is possible for peace to be one-sided. 
as you continue to do the hard and the challenging work as ambassadors of Christ to do the work of peacemaking, there are times that you will not be met with active participation by the other party. But that doesn't absolve us of our role and responsibility in this work. I think we've heard throughout this whole series that peace is not exclusively the end goal, but it is the way. And if we understand that peace is the way, then peace is possible as a one-sided reality. The question really for us this morning is, can we adopt the postures and the practices of peacemaking in a way that honors our invitation to be the ministers of reconciliation? Let's pray. God, we believe that you want uh, big things for our community. God, we believe that you desire for our community to be a force of peacemaking and that that starts with our relationships uh, with, uh, with each other. Lord, I pray that, uh, that you would lead the internal work that's required to bring us to these postures, that we may be uh, people who fully... Um, adopt our roles as ambassadors of you in the world around us, that we would do the internal work to adopt these postures towards people, and that you would continually drive us to engaging in the active practices of peacemaking. Lord, for your sake, so that people may see us and get a glimpse of you, and ultimately, Lord, so that your name and your kingdom can be more realized uh, in our relationships and in the world around us. God, we pray these things in your name. Amen.